Hey there, YouTube, the Dapper. Wait, this isn't my channel. Yeah, you're on my channel while I'm away. My daughter's birthday's coming up, so I kidnapped you to perform for my audience while I take the day off. Okay then, hello. I'm the Dapper Dino. I'm normally in my very nerdy room, but today I guess I'm in this VJ loop on Vice Rhino's channel. Oh well, I'm here to talk about everyone's favorite paragon of inability to understand science, Matt, the air in space, Powell. You see, I'm sort of a dinosaur guy, as you might be able to tell. So when Matt Powell decided to say silly things about dinosaurs, I decided to talk about that. As you may or may not know, Matt Powell is someone who could make Kent Hovind look like an expert on dinosaurs and physics. So let's see what he has to say. But first, let me roll my fancy intro. <laughs> Hey guys, this is Matt Powell. Hey Matt, how's Dr. Peel, the giant inflatable banana you keep in your yard? So, after the duck-billed dinosaurs surfed to Africa and went extinct... Well, no, they rafted, not surfed. You see, for some reason, Matt here has a problem with the idea of rafting animals crossing bodies of water. This is bizarre, because young Earth creationism needs to get at least every tetrapod in the world to their current location from somewhere in Turkey. For birds and bats, this isn't really much of a problem. But how about tortoises and lizards? How do they get places, like the Galapagos? Or how did anything get back to Australia? One option would be on vegetative mats. You see, after certain particularly strong storms such as hurricanes and typhoons, knocked over trees and other vegetation can form mats on the ocean, and animals can cling to these to avoid drowning as they become exhausted trying to stay afloat. Now, the chances of a modern animal going between the Americas and the Old World on a raft in modern times is pretty small. But you have to remember that going back in the past, this east-west divide was smaller and smaller until you get all the way back to Pangaea. So monkeys, dinosaurs, rodents, etc. all managed to raft between Africa and South America just fine, and some animals managed to raft between North and South America too. Now I can hear the creationists clamoring about historical science and asking when we see rafting in recent times. Well, up until some point in 1995, the island of Anguilla an island in the Eastern Caribbean governed as a British overseas territory, had as far as everyone can tell, never ever had a single green iguana on it. But now it's full of them. You see, in 1995, the first green iguanas were washed onshore on a raft made of plant debris from a hurricane. So maybe Matt should just accept rafting, as it helps with one of the innumerable problems with young earth creationism. And after the sauropod dinosaurs farted themselves into extinction, See, this is the danger of getting your news about science from pop sci articles, especially those by Fox News. The real paper in question doesn't say anything about a dinosaur extinction. Instead, it uses a rough model to say that dinosaurs may have led to some warming via waste gases such as methane from plant consumption. This isn't so crazy as modern cattle are a contributor to climate change today. Plus, if sauropods were supposed to be the main offenders in dino farts, as Powell suggests, then that problem would have been mostly solved by the end Cretaceous, as sauropods had long since ceased to be the dominant land herbivores in most parts of the world, really only clinging on in South America and southern Laramidia. But of course, this is the guy who said this. But in space, wouldn't it be a different scenario based on the fact that, you know, the, 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 the space and the air in the space is much different than the air we have here? So, are we really that surprised? There was one species of dinosaurs that made it through these many, many millions of years of time. Actually, no. We know that Paleonaths, Neoaves, Anceriformes, and Galliforms all separately made it through the KPG extinction event. So, at least four species, and almost certainly quite a few more than that, survived. This is because we know from genetic testing backed up by fossils that these four groups of birds were already distinct by the time of the asteroid impact that spelled the end of the Cretaceous. So for them to be alive today, they had to have survived. Yeah, at this point, Matt includes the Nintendo Wii music. In an effort not to force Vice Rhino to share profits with Nintendo, I'm unfortunately going to have to mute it. But, uh, no. Chickens are members of Galliformes, so they didn't survive the KPG extinction. Their ancestors did. They evolved later. In fact, modern chickens are descended from the red jungle fowl. So this is what evolution actually teaches, is that T-Rex dinosaurs turned into launch at KFC. No, T-Rex did not evolve into birds. 
So, broadly speaking, birds came about in the mid to late Jurassic, depending on exactly how you want to define bird. Tyrannosauroidea also had diverged around then. Here's a cladogram of Silurosauria, the most exclusive group of dinosaurs that includes both T. rex and modern birds. You'll notice that among a large diversity of dinosaurs, including Avamimids, Raptors, Troodontids, Ovaraptorosaurs, and Therizinosaurs, Tyrannosauroids are the least closely related to birds. T. rex was not an ancestor to birds, and it wasn't particularly close to them in the grand scheme of things. If you look at the uh, anatomy of a chicken... Oh. oh, don't worry. In case you guys and gals don't know, looking at the anatomy of dinosaurs is kind of my thing. We will be looking at it in depth. If you look at the build of this chicken, you can see that it clearly descended from a T. rex. Not really. You can see how in a T. rex they had short, stubby arms. And apparently now the chicken's able to do a handstand with those arms because those arms evolved down into its legs, for one. So no, I have no clue where the air in space got this idea. Probably the same place he got the giant inflatable banana, Dr. Peel. So let's ignore the use of T-Rex here, because if I point it out each time that he's wrong that birds are descended specifically from T-Rex, I'll be saying it every few seconds. So let's just assume that he means that bird legs are homologous to dinosaurian forelimbs. Well, of course, the first problem here is that just like non-bird dinosaurs, the legs of chickens are connected to the sacrum, that is, the hip bones. You might not be surprised about that, as it's basically high school anatomy, but yeah. So let's look at some connections between birds and the wider dinosauria that we can find in the legs of all dinosaurs and birds in particular. Let's start with the median line of the animal and work our way distally. So at as medial as medial can be, we come to the sacral vertebrae. Dinosaurs are distinctive in having a lot of these. More than five, in fact, is diagnostic for dinosaurs. Chickens have about 13, themselves divided up into a few subcategories. Now, the attachment of these vertebrae to the sacral arches is also important for determining if chickens are dinosaurs. You see, characteristically, dinosaurs have the vertebrae of their hips firmly attached to the sacral arches, and chickens too have this condition, solidifying their position as dinosaurs. Next, we'll go for the acetabulum, or hip socket. Dinosaurs have an open ring of bone rather than a cup of bone like other animals. This condition is called open, or extensively perforate. Chickens, like all birds, also have an open acetabulum, along with every dinosaur that ever dinosaured. Well, now we're done with the hips as such, and we'll see if there's anything about the femur, which might connect chickens, to dinosaurs. Well, the first characteristic of dinosaur femurs is that their femoral head is distinct from the femoral shaft and offset at an angle. This is what allows dinosaurs to have their legs support them like columns, rather than having sprawling legs like a lizard. Well, of course, chickens also hold their legs under them and not out to the side, so you'll be unsurprised to learn that chicken femoral heads are in fact distinctly offset like any other dinosaurs, including T. rex, but also including much more bird-like animals such as Velociraptor mongoliensis. Going further distally, we come to a unique part of the femur of archosaurs. Archosauria is a wider taxonomic group than dinosaurs. It includes dinosaurs, pterosaurs, as well as crocodilians and their relatives, such as Phenosuchians, Thalatosuchians, Rawasuchians, etc. And while technically I already covered them, I'm going to mention the Planocranids, a group of paleogene hoofed running crocodilians. Why do I mention them? Well, because hooved crocs were a thing, and that's simply terrifying and awesome. You're welcome. This bit of anatomy is the fourth trochanter of the femur. It's the site of attachment for a muscle that stretches between the femur and the base of the tail, called the caudofemoralis longus muscle. In archosaurs, it is the main retractor muscle of the femur, doing the same job in archosaurs as the gluteus muscles of mammals. But having this muscle and associated trochanter only makes chickens archosaurs. What connects them with dinosaurs specifically is that the trochanter itself is asymmetrical in dinosaurs, just like it is in chickens and all other birds. Now, let's skip all the way down to the ankle. So dinosaurs as well as pterosaurs and some related organisms, such as lycurpetids and silosaurs, are all members of a group called ornithodira, also sometimes called Ava metatarsalia. While I'll spare you the complications of ankle bone anatomy, Let's just say that all ornithodirons have ankle joints that swing like hinges. This is unlike those of most animals, like humans or crocodiles, that can swing a bit like a ball and socket joint. Just try it with your foot. You can move your foot side to side, up and down, and you can swing it right to left to change the forward orientation. Well, dinosaurs, chickens included, can only move their foot up and down. Additionally, like all dinosaurs, chickens have an acute angle of the anterior lateral margin of the astragalus. But, um, that's a bit on the technical side of an already increasingly technical video. Now, this is more of a theropod trait than a dinosaur trait, but hey, if you're a theropod, you're a dinosaur. This is a unique interface of the phalanges of the foot. 
These fit together so that the distal end has a convex interface, and the proximal end has a concave surface that fits directly into the convex surface of the previous phalange. While there is in fact even more about the legs that connect chickens to their dinosaurian relatives and ancestors, for now we're going to get back to Mr. Powell. This one wants to fly. So obviously they developed wings so that they could fly. Well, let's look at the arms of the closest organisms to birds that aren't birds. That is, the Eumaniraptorans. In fact, their forelimb anatomy is more or less identical to that of modern birds, except that birds have fused the finger bones to keep the distalmost part of the wing more rigid to help with flight. Like all Manoraptorans, except for a few Alvarosaurids, birds have three fingers and a semilunate carpal bone. This is a wrist bone that you might have heard of if you're a fan of the movie Jurassic Park. Look at the half moon shaped bones on the wrists. But also interestingly, basal Manoraptorans use essentially the same forelimb motions to capture prey as birds do for flapping. And they also had feathers, as evidenced not only by full flight feathers preserved in smaller raptors, like Microraptor Gooey, but also found in the quill knobs of Velociraptor, and as seen indirectly in the brooding behavior of even more distant relatives like Ovaraptorosaurs. So really, what's the difference between a chicken wing and, say, a Velociraptor arm? Well, in the bird wing, the fingers are fused, the thumb bears a flight feather called an alula, and the shoulder girdle is more robust, but ultimately raptor arms just are wings. Especially since we know of gliding raptors, like the aforementioned, Microraptor. Not really. Actually, that's another fail of natural selection. So I'm not sure how evolving to be power flyers is a fail of natural selection, but then I'm not going to try too hard to understand the craziness that is the mind of the air in space. So natural selection didn't do very good things for this chicken. And in fact, I guarantee you she's scared to death of me. Given that natural selection selects what reproduces best and the chickens are doing pretty well, and that the red jungle fowl is not at all in danger of extinction and lives throughout Southeast Asia and Polynesia, I think natural selection is doing just fine by the chicken. And that's not really how a T-Rex would be if it was truly survival of the fittest and only the strongest survive. But you see, in evolutionary biology, fitness isn't the kind of thing you get at the gym. It's a measure of reproductive success. And if being weaker, smaller, more skittish, or whatever means that you have more descendants than your peers, you're more fit. In fact, being a giant carnivore is a rather precarious position to be in. You depend heavily on an abundance of large prey. On the other hand, being a small omnivore like a chicken is a pretty safe bet. You're almost always going to have enough to eat because you're adaptable. So far from T-Rex being more fit than chickens, it is by far the other way around. They say that we started out simple and became complex, and then the strongest organisms and the strongest animals were able to survive and wipe out the weakest. Nope, as a result of things like niche partitioning, many animals can coexist in the same environment with stronger and weaker animals. And, as I said, being strong in the sense of being able to lift a lot doesn't necessarily help. For example, if you don't need to be strong to get your food and avoid predators, then the extra energy expended developing big muscles just means less energy can be devoted to reproduction. So natural selection will favor being weak. Similarly, brains are a big energy sink, and if you don't need to be smart to get your food and reproduce, evolution may in fact favor animals getting smaller brains and becoming dumber. Evolution isn't here to satisfy Matt Powell's subjective preferences. It's a mechanism that keeps organisms well adapted to their environment, whether he likes the results or not. Well, if that were true, why do we even have chicken? Again, it's not true, but we have chickens because they are small, so they don't need much food compared to larger birds. They can eat seeds, bugs, small vertebrates, berries, etc. Basically, if they can swallow it, they can and will eat it. They have a short reproductive cycle, and while they're not too smart, they are more than capable of scratching predators and making themselves to be a bit of a pain to deal with. And when it comes to roosters, they even have rather dangerous spurs on their feet, making them quite dangerous. So really, chickens are an excellently adapted organism that is even adapting to increasing urbanization in its habitat. Chickens and their wild counterparts may not be as impressive as a sauropod or a T-Rex or even as a mammoth. But guess what? Nature doesn't care if you find things impressive. Chickens still exist because they're good at not dying long enough to have plenty of offspring. Simple as. This thing shouldn't even exist if evolution was true. It would have died off. I mean, they are, they went from predators that could kill you down to, well, if you're like me, your very best friend. First of all, I don't think that chicken likes Matt much, and I don't blame it. But second, chickens remain predators. They will kill just about anything they can. Chickens will eat rodents, lizards, snakes, insects, worms, etc. Just because they're not going to prey on a human doesn't make them not fearsome predators. And remember, the animals that are actually closely related to birds, in fact, were not generally all that big. Animals like Anchiornis, Microraptor, etc. I didn't think that 
people would actually believe that reptiles actually grew feathers and started flying. Well, I already covered wings from the standpoint of non-avian dinosaurs who already had feathers, so let's talk about feather development. Feathers are an integumentary structure that develops from embryonic placodes. Placodes are a thickening of skin. In mammals, they fold inward and turn into hair follicles. In most reptiles, they stay at the surface and harden into scales. In birds, they form a ring from which a feather grows. All of these places are controlled by the same developmental hox genes, and they are in the broadest sense homologous. Interestingly, both birds and other reptiles form their scales and feathers from a form of keratin that is chemically distinct from that used by mammals to make their hair. Mammals use alpha keratin, while birds and other reptiles use beta keratin. So from a chemical basis, bird feathers are actually quite similar to scales. But do we have any intermediates for feather evolution from scales? In fact, we do. Before they were even discovered in fossils, they were hypothesized, and the protofeathers were split into four numbered types, from a simple filament to a symmetrical branching structure, nearly the same as we see in modern birds. As it turns out, we have found examples of all such structures, so let's go through them. Stage 1 protofeathers are just simple hollow filaments that grow evenly from a circular follicle, developed from an embryonic placode. We can see these feathers all through dinosauria, including ornithischians such as protoceratopsids and heterodontosaurids, which are about as far away from birds as you can get while still being a dinosaur. But then we also find it in theropods and animals like Scuromimus, the squirrel mimic dinosaur, so called because of its bushy tail, full of stage 1 protofeathers. Stage 2 protofeathers are similar to down and involve a number of filaments growing from a circular follicle. The follicle breaks into tiny little sections, each of which sends up its own frond. We can see this in Salurosaurs, which is the group to which both T. rex and birds belong, as stated before. Animals with these feathers include Juravenator and Eutyrannus. Stage 3a and 3b are similar and both are a central rachis with fronds, which is the result of the fragmented follicle from stage 2 gaining a directional preference and the fronds of the feather growing into it only to split farther up again. In stage 3b, even these fronds that break off from the central rachis themselves have fronds. These are known from animals such as ornithomimosaurs, for example Gallimimus or Struthiomimus. Stage 4 is when we get to actual feathers as we know them in the contour feathers of modern birds. We know of these from a number of organisms that are quite closely related to birds, such as Therizinosauria, Oviraptorosauria, Scansoriopteridae, Deinonychosauria, and Anchiornithidae. Those taxa were just listed in order from least to most bird-like. Obviously, chickens can't fly. Um, chickens can indeed fly. They're just poor flyers, like all Galliformes, such as turkeys, grouse, partridges, quail, etc. Further, Matt showing a chicken that gets down from a roof doesn't really help his case. Where else was it going to fly to but down from there? It's not like there was another tall roof or a tree for it to fly to. But chickens can also fly up. Here's some evidence. So here's the thing, if you're an evolutionist and you're looking for dinosaurs and you want to find dinosaur bones, look, you could find some live ones today. Yes, birds are dinosaurs and their bones are dinosaur bones, but they are also common. The dinosaur bones paleontologists tend to be interested in are the ones of extinct animals, because those are the ones we don't know as much about. Science is about learning, and we have a lot more to learn about extinct non-avian dinosaurs than we do modern birds. Further, the study of extant and recently extinct birds is taken up by ornithologists, who use different techniques to paleontologists. If you're interested in trying to study early Cretaceous hadrosaur biogeography, then looking at some parrot isn't going to help you at all. Right here in my hands, I actually hold proof of evolution. Actually, I agree with Matt here, which feels weird to say. But yes, birds are indeed a stunning example of evolution, with their many adaptations to flight based clearly on various aspects of dinosaur anatomy, from their bones to their wing muscles to their strange, but very dinosaurian respiratory system, to even their complex digestive system with a crop and gizzard like dinosaurs. The more you know about dinosaurs in general, and birds in particular, the harder it is to pretend that the latter is not simply a subset of the former, and you can tell just by taking apart a chicken, as we've seen. They're the only species that didn't go extinct, but just devolved instead of evolved into chickens. There is no such thing as devolution, or de-evolution. The fact is that Matt is just repeating that he thinks T-Rex is cooler than chickens. And you know what? It's fair to hold that opinion. Tyrannosaurians were incredible organisms, with many fascinating adaptations to the role of apex predator at a time when prey organisms were themselves monstrously big and strong. But Matt isn't in charge of what counts as fitness. And so, this is just a proof that natural selection fails for them, even if this was true, because... 
I can't see how, but maybe Matt will explain it in terms that actually matter for science. Natural selection, they say, sets genes up for the benefit of the species and selects those genes that benefit the T-Rex. No, natural selection can't set up genes. New alleles arise from mutations and then are acted upon by selection. But selection itself doesn't drive the new genetic variation. Matt, it seems, would fail a grade school exam on evolutionary biology. But here's the thing. The chicken didn't really get benefited by this. Its survival is proof positive that it did. In fact, the chicken went from being a predator in evolution theory to one of the biggest preys that are out there in creation now. Evolution isn't a race to be apex predator in an environment. That's not some intrinsically desirable niche. It's just one that a lot of humans find cool. In fact, in the long run, being an apex predator means that you're likely to be unable to adapt to significant changes in the environment. And apex predators have a tendency to go extinct while their prey keep on trucking. One example is the American pronghorn, Antilocopra americana, which is one of the fastest animals on Earth and is the highest jumper of all land mammals. It is much, much faster than any predators in North America. And why is that? Well, because it was adapted to survive predation by the American cheetah, an organism that is now extinct, but which was, like many extinct predators in the Americas, at or near the top of the food chain. Other examples include the short-faced bear, the dire wolf, and the American lion. They constantly have to put up fences and stuff to keep these things in and keep them protected from animals because otherwise they're going to get destroyed. I like how Matt says destroyed like this is an episode of Power Rangers and he can't say killed lest the censors say his show isn't appropriate for children. Oh brilliant! The Power Rangers destroyed by another teenager! But that's not true of the wild jungle fowl. Instead, it's only true for domesticated chickens who have not been operating under natural selection but artificial selection. And artificial selection acts to make chickens good at serving the needs of humans, not at surviving without humans, especially since they generally don't have to. So to say that the greatest creature of all time, the T-Rex, the most fierce animal, devolved into a chicken, and people actually believe that? Folks, it just goes to show that evolution theory is a complete joke on all fronts. No, this video goes to show that Aaron Space's idea of evolutionary theory is a straw man on all fronts. Anybody who just takes a moment to consider what evolution actually teaches about dinosaurs in general, it just goes to show the facts are on our side. There has never been a single fact that would indicate young Earth creationism has any truth to it beyond the trivial, such as that it says that the universe exists. And the fiction fairy tales are on the evolutionist side. Look, I'm not Vice Rhino, and I don't bother trying to debunk Christianity as a whole, or the Bible, or whatever. But I just gotta say, when your idea about how biodiversity came about includes a talking snake, maybe complaining about people believing fairy tales isn't the best look. From that point on, Matt just summarizes his previous points, so there's no point in going over it. Thank you so much for watching this video, and I also want to thank Vice Rhino for letting me temporarily take over his channel. If you want to check out more of my content, which focuses on debunking creationism, but also touches on some conspiracy theories and medical pseudoscience, feel free to head over to my channel and check it out. I assume that anyone fancy enough to have a name that's an anagram for Eric Hovind, and who wears a bow tie, will have a link in my description. With that, I'll remind you to hit like, subscribe to Vice Rhino if you aren't already, and of course, comment on and share this video. I hope to see you soon. I'm the Dapper Dinosaur. <laughs> How would you tell people that this You first, first, first. How would you tell Well, that's a question I don't know. I don't know.